Can I have your attention? I, um, Se Secretary Campbell has arrived, so we'll start. Uh, on B uh, my name is Murray Hebert. I work on Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands here at CSIS. Uh, on behalf of CSIS, welcome all of you. We're delighted to have so many of you. Um, as you I think everybody knows our guest, um, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Kurt Campbell uh, for the Asia Pacific. Uh, sorry, did I screw that up? Tough trip to get devoted. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Did I do? Th I think I got assistant, but um, yes, yeah, assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and the Pacific. Uh, he's had uh, a raft of uh, uh, different jobs in the administration, in the White House, and in, in DOD, and also done various things with, within the think tank community, including here at CSIS in his previous incarnation. He's just back from a trip with Secretary Clinton. Uh, they visited um, uh, many countries, as you know. Uh, today's the, the start of today's conversation is going to be on the Pacific Islands. Uh, that's how we build it. I know there are people in the room who uh, probably want to talk about some other things, but let's. Uh, uh, Ass uh, Ass Assistant Secretary Campbell is going to start there, and he's. We'd like to at least have the question start uh, on the Pacific Islands. Thank you very much. It's just terrific that Vanuatu is finally getting the des attention it deserves. Um, um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here at CSIS, to be back at CSIS, and I want to thank uh, in particular Murray, uh, Ernie, uh, Mike Green, John Hamry, all the people, Bonnie at CSIS, that have really made this institution such a landmark in Asian studies, and we always appreciate the opportunity to come and exchange views. I, I know many of you want to talk about some other matters, but I hope you will indulge me for a few moments to talk about something that frankly is, is quite near and dear to my heart and to many in the audience as well. Um, I think when um, we talk about a refocusing or greater attention on the Asia Pacific region, most of the time uh, the A, the big A, gets all the attention and the small P gets remarkably little attention. And in truth, uh, as we think about refocusing and more uh, intensity of effort, it is important for the United States to recognize and to respect uh, a very deep uh, strategic, uh, moral, uh, historical set of obligations and engagements uh, in the Pacific. Um, we uh, were blessed over the course of the last few months to have a number of engagements in the Pacific, and it was a reminder that about six, 70 years ago during this period of time, some of the most decisive battles uh, of the Second World War were fought. Uh, and uh, to remember those sacrifices, and on those sacrifices we have built uh, the post-Cold War uh, era in Asia, which has uh, sustained remarkable progress and prosperity going forward. So I just want to say a few words about that if I can, and then I'd be happy to take questions as we go forward. Um, when um, uh, we came to power, when, when the President and the Secretary and others came to power and we tried to listen to colleagues uh, in the Asian Pacific region, it, particularly in the Pacific, we heard uh, a general view that over a sustained period of time, not five or ten years, but 20 or 25 years, that the United States had not paid enough attention to the Pacific. We had not been systematically engaged uh, enough, and there was a strong desire to see the United States do more, both in terms of high level, uh, resources, coordination, engagement, and uh, the overall role of uh, the Pacific in uh, global architecture and the challenges uh, that modern civilization, climate change and the like have brought to uh, the Pacific Islands. Um, what we tried to do was set up with a series of very high level engagements. Every fall, uh, Secretary Clinton met with the Pacific Island leaders in New York uh, at the UN General Assembly. Uh, we had a number of uh, uh, substantial meetings at the Pacific Island Forum. Last year, Deputy Secretary Tom Nides brought almost 55 people from the U.S. government uh, from about 16 different agencies uh, out uh, to uh, New Zealand for uh, a very important set of interactions in which we brought new resources, new capability, new focus to some of the problems that we were dealing with. But to give you a sense of contrast, four years before that, we had sent three people. 
um, uh, from one agency with the highest rank of uh, office director. And so to go from that to deputy secretary uh, and a very substantial new set of engagements, I think, reflects at least a desire uh, to step up our game uh, overall. And then last year at uh, uh, APEC and at the East Asia Summit, when we had our se uh, initial sessions in Hawaii, uh, the President and the Secretary both entertained the Pacific Island leaders, the first meeting of its kind since, since uh, George H.W. Bush uh, also hosted with my friend Peter Watson uh, many, uh, many years before. So um, uh, in these interactions, we've tried to underscore several things. Uh, first of all, that there are a number of initiatives that we have to work with partners on um, to uh, ensure that our engagement is sustainable and effective. If you look at the Pacific, it suffers from many of the challenges that many of the developing world faces. But because of the tyranny of distances, because of the enormous challenges of delivery of energy and such, it's hard to get economies of scale. Overall, because of the generosity and support of a number of countries, New Zealand, Australia, the European Union, uh, Japan, China, Taiwan, and the United States, uh, the Pacific actually has a very substantial amount of resources that are directed towards aid and development, health and resources, women's issues and the like. The problem has been generally a lack of coordination and integration. Uh, and what we have seen uh, over the course of the last several years that was begun by former Prime Minister, um, uh, former Prime Minister of, of Australia, no, no, the Kevin Rudd. Rudd, Kevin Rudd, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, oh, oh, for two so far today here. Uh, uh, Kevin Rudd, who brought in uh, to play a substantial effort about integration of resources. We have done a better job of late to try to integrate certain work on education. We've just launched a major initiative at the East West Center on uh, Pacific, uh, Pacific Island education to try to identify uh, the next generation of leaders that can play a role. There, but we've also made clear to all the partners in the region that we are prepared to work collaboratively um, on uh, issues of mutual interest. Um, Secretary Clinton, uh, this uh, year, uh, about last week, actually was the first Secretary of State in 50 years to go to the Pacific Island Forum to represent the United States. And this is the gathering, this is the multilateral uh, gathering. Uh, of all the key uh, nations, and she came with a number of initiatives. Now, last year, in an environment in which essentially we're cutting back on resources and aid and assistance, the United States opened, uh, reopened a U.S. Uh, AID office uh, in Papua New Guinea, uh, and we have brought new resources there to focus on climate change, to focus on issues associated again with development, uh, uh, issues with child mortality and the like. Many of these problems are endemic, endemic throughout the Pacific. But the effort does not end there. She also went with Admiral Locklear um, uh, from uh, U.S. Pacific Command. We pay tribute not only to the sacrifices that were made in the past, but also to the work that's ongoing today. We have a lot of innovative programs, one called the Ship Rider Program. It's the vast area, huge amount of, of fishing, uh, a tremendous amount of poaching and the like, but allowing uh, certain kinds of legal cooperation with these Pacific Islanders has given us greater ability to access and patrol and to police certain areas over overfishing uh, and the like, and that's been extraordinarily important. Uh, uh, Admiral Locklear and his colleagues have helped support in terms of uh, maritime domain awareness and a number of initiatives that are designed to help uh, the Pacific uh, uh, be sustainable. The last true great fishing uh, resources, the last great tuna pod is uh, still in the Pacific. We are actively engaged in the negotiations with all the partners to ensure that we come up with an arrangement that is both equitable but will allow for this really uh, still healthy uh, fishing uh, preserve to be sustained. Um, we have worked particularly and frankly very hard with Australia and New Zealand to ensure that our approach to a number of challenges is well coordinated. The Secretary had a trilateral meeting uh, with uh, Australia and New Zealand. Now, that may not seem like a very big deal, but it's been decades since we've been able to engage 
uh, uh, New Zealand in the way, frankly, I believe that they deserve and that needs to happen in terms of the kinds of uh, sacrifices that New Zealand has made with us on the battlefields of Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, and also the close work that we are doing together. And I want to thank particularly the ambassadors here who's been a, a leader in that effort. This trilateral between Australia, New Zealand, and the United States allows us to deal with some of the big challenges of development, also the challenge of the lack of democracy in Fiji. Much of the infrastructure of uh, the Pacific is built around Fiji, uh, and uh, given its uh, status still, uh, uh, very difficult challenges, not clear path towards uh, elections uh, uh, in the near future. Uh, we remain in very close contact and dialogue with our partners, Australia and New Zealand, and the rest of the island's uh, nations who have an enormous interest in how this issue is um, uh, dealt with. Um, uh, in addition, the Secretary had uh, uh, on the Cook Islands a very uh, major initiative following on a uh, previous stop that she had taken two, two years ago in Papua New Guinea on the status of women in the Pacific, an enormously important issue and one that animates, an issue that animates all of her work, not just in Asia and the Pacific, but uh, throughout um, the world. And so I think um, what you will see over the course of the next uh, few years, I believe, is a momentum to our engagement. I think we all recognize that there are limitations to the uh, amount and the extent of our assistance, but we have um, uh, an important role to play historically. We have partners to work with, and if you look at our efforts on the Tuna Treaty, we're working with uh, New Zealand on what could be one of the largest um, set-asides in terms of uh, 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 preserve the Ross Sea, which could be enormous, uh, very substantial in terms of environmental protection. We've also made clear, and this is very important, that we want to cooperate with other nations. We're working very closely with, as I stated, Japan, uh, with uh, the EU, with Australia and New Zealand. But the Secretary stated quite clearly and quite directly when we were uh, on the road in the Pacific and throughout the Asia-Pacific region that the entire basis of our approach is that we believe that it is important for the United States and China to demonstrate that we are going to work together and that we're going to find credible uh, sustained uh, uh, efforts at development, at uh, uh, you know, personal well-being, at construction, where the two uh, uh, countries can work together in a way that sends a very clear message uh, of our uh, determination to work together uh, in the 21st century. And I think that message was heard, and it's quite clear, and we've had a number of discussions with uh, uh, our interlocutors in the foreign ministry, and we are beginning the path and process of certain areas of diplomacy and development in Timor, and I believe that we will be able to do more uh, in the Pacific uh, in uh, the months and years ahead. I think that's a general background uh, about the Pacific. If anyone has any particular questions about the Pacific, why don't we start with them, and then we can, if, if you know... <laughs> If there are other questions that people want to address, I'll do my best to, to address them, okay? And there will be some that I will probably suggest uh, enough has been said about as well. And, and I, I suggest that um, you please uh, wait for a microphone and then introduce yourself uh, and your affiliation, please. So please begin with a Pacific Island question. Uh, well, um, my name's Hui Wang with CCTV America. Mm -hmm. Why don't, why don't, if, we, if you don't mind, could we start with a few Pacific Island questions before we go right into those? And then I'll be happy to try to address. Priscilla, please. Uh, I'm Priscilla Clapp. I'm retired. <laughs> um, you mentioned that in, in previous years we haven't paid much attention to the South Pacific and that you were trying to design programs that would carry out into the future. How do you guarantee that? I mean, how do you actually design programs that you can commit the next administration yeah. to? Because there's not much left of this one. So. <laughs> no, no, I don't, I don't, so. I just mean that so it's, it's almost a, the so end so of a, so a four-year term, so, not so the people in it. Yeah, so delicately put, yeah. <laughs> and, 
and with, with such gratitude for service. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, well, well Prasai, I think you know well that you can't. And what you have to do is make a sustained case for engagement. I have to say that although we are in an intense uh, uh, political season, I'm very pleased by the fact that generally I think there is a very strong bipartisan commitment to uh, enhance engagement in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, I believe that, that uh, the areas of quibbles are about uh, the how, not the weather. And so I take uh, great comfort in that. I think the Asian Pacific region does as well. I think there are questions about, um, about sustainment. If you think of what the 2009 question, frankly, that we heard when we were traveling around Asia was, do Americans recognize that the lion's share of the history of the 21st century is going to be written in the Asia Pacific region? Are you going to orient your diplomacy accordingly? And you compare that with the 2013 question, which is, okay, you know, you've made a start and there's some important stuff underway. Can you sustain it? I'll take the 2013 question over the 2009 question every time. Another Pacific Island question? Please, Ambassador. I wanted to take issue with one of the points that uh, Secretary Campbell made. Although, overall, I'm very happy with the uh, greater attention that uh, is being given to the Pacific Islands. I think it is something that is being long overdue, and uh, we look forward to some very positive things coming out of it. But you made mention of Fiji and said that there was no clear path to back to democracy. As you probably know, we have written documents, we have a road map, we have a pathway and the processes are in place to get back to elections in 2014. We have right now a commission, constitution review commission that is, uh, that is taking submissions from the people to craft a new constitution. We've had electoral rules uh, produced and we believe we've had a roadmap for the last three years and we're on that roadmap to elections in 2014. So I think it's uh, <coughs> something that should be recognized, which hasn't been recognized by some of the metropolitan powers, particularly Australia and New Zealand, our neighbors, who still remain our very good friends, as you do. But uh, thank you for the attention that is being paid, and I congratulate the Secretary Clinton and, and the delegation that came. Thank you. Um, one more question. <laughs> this, is, this, is like, <laughs> this is like homework that we I give. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. We have a microphone. Yeah. Maybe I don't need a microphone. Yes, I can hear you, but I, th I think they need to record it, sir. So they, here it comes now. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Um, my name is Wood Hong. I'm from George Mason University. Mm -hmm. My question is about the new attention paid to the Pacific. You mentioned that, you know, we used to mention Asia Pacific, and now it's Pacific. So, the Chinese, so many Chinese has complained that that would be like a containing of China. But the on the other hand, my question is that we, our priority is limited. If you are uh, committed in, in uh, Pacific Island, does that mean that uh, you have to be less paying attention to some troubled part of Asia? Well, thank you very much. And I probably misspoke or miss, I, I didn't mean to suggest that we should somehow disaggregate the Pacific from Asia, although many Pacific leaders and uh, friends believe that there is a unique quality to the Pacific and they want to be engaged uh, in that right. I, I think the, the key here is that um, uh, what we are hoping to do uh, in the Pacific does not detract from our overall engagement in Asia. We'd like to see it as an additive. And I must say, every year I, I have taken a trip through the Pacific with the head of US, uh, the number two in Pacific Command, this year Admiral Haney, and my good colleague Edgar Kagan and I, we had an interagency team from the White House, from uh, the State Department, the Pentagon, we went through you know 10 or 11 island nations to be able to underscore our engagement. And what was what has often um, concerning is we would meet it with uh, 
with senior officials from some of these islands, and they would say things like, I remember the last time an American came here. It was in, I think, the 1950s, those kinds of things. And that's, that's not sustainable. We, we, we have to do a better job of that kind of engagement. So I don't think, I, what I, I don't want to say that somehow the two should be separate. Uh, and I also believe that this is part of an engagement strategy that, um, uh, frankly, uh, I think is based on, as I suggested, moral, uh, uh, commercial, uh, economic, and people-to-people -people realities. We have large numbers of Pacific Island neighbors and uh, peoples that serve in our armed forces that are citizens of the United States. Uh, there are many reasons for us to be engaged. I just... The, uh, the, the basis of our approach is that there are so many challenges and opportunities in the Pacific that we are looking for partners and that we believe, I fundamentally and fully believe, that the United States and China will be able to work together like we work with other nations in the Asia-Pacific region. This is not some sort of strategic um, chessboard. It is an area of enormous need, uh, tremendous uh, challenges in which we have uh, an opportunity to work together to try to meet. But why don't we just take questions then? Okay. okay. <laughs> she asked the question All right. first. So yeah. Do you want to repeat your question? Yeah. I'm so glad your homework is finished. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm Hui Wang with CCTV America. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, what's your reaction to Japan's move to purchase and nationalize mm -hmm. Yaoyu Islands? And if there were any escalation between Japan and China, how would the U.S. react to that? Thank you. Um, let me just say, as Secretary Clinton underscored um, uh, when she traveled to the region, obviously we do not take uh, a position on any of the territorial claims. We think in the current environment we want cooler heads to prevail, frankly, that we have enormous stakes in the maintenance of peace and stability, that um, if you look at uh, slowdown in Europe, uh, still uh, emerging economic uh, situation in the United States, uh, this is the cockpit of the global economy, and the stakes could not be bigger. And I think uh, the desire is to have all leaders to keep that squarely in mind. And we believe that peaceful dialogue and the maintenance of peace and stability is of utmost importance always, but particularly now in this set of circumstances. And I think in her public comments and in her private interactions, Sec Secretary Clinton sought to underscore this with every country we dealt with. And we asked all countries to refrain from provocative actions, to seek dialogue, and to maintain peace and stability. Now, on these particular questions, I'm just going to suggest to you, and I apologize, I'm not going to have anything else to say. So if you want to ask me a question on this further, I'm going to refer back to that statement. So I'm not going to be rude, but that's going to be what I say, OK? Uh, OK. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, no, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not John, please. John, yeah, hey, John, John. Zan with CPI TV see. of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Mr. Secretary, uh, uh, State Department spokesperson um, Tory uh, Newland yesterday called on uh, Japan and China to uh, resolve the issue through a dialogue. I just want to uh, uh, to uh, to know um, on what basis does the uh, State Department want the two countries to conduct their dialogue on the um, on the aftermath of the Japan, unilateral Japanese move to purchase or nationalize the uh, Diaoyu Islands, or on the status prior to the Japanese move. Thank you very much. Uh, in other words, is the United States calling on Japan to reconsider or reverse its decision, which is the root cause of the current escalating mm -hmm. tension? Thank you. I think I, think I will, uh, again, as I indicated, and, th and thank you, John, for your question, um, uh, stand on what I had just stated. Thank you. Gentleman with a blue shirt on. Thanks. Uh, Jeff Stacy from Hi, Jeff. SICE, Center mm -hmm. for Transatlantic Relations. When I left the State Department last year, I really had very little idea of the degree to which what I would call almost the entirety of the U.S. foreign policy establishment uh, increasingly alarmed about China. And 
it stretches all the way to New York. Our foundations don't fund things related to Europe anymore. It's all about the Pacific, and you've explained why that's, you think, strategically necessary. But the moves to Darwin, to Singapore, to the Philippines, all pivotal moves, if you will, even though you're not using that language anymore, is there not a downside to this? Doesn't China basically have no intentions of competing militarily with the U.S. to the degree that um, our allies, they're asking for us to stand with them. So isn't there a kind of backlash happening that we saw in your visit, the way that the secretary was treated, that the subtext was really a reaction to these moves and that China may now compete, be more readily competitive than they otherwise would be if we continue to take steps like this? The United States, uh, the Secretary was treated well on this trip. We had a very good, very substantive, um, very productive discussions and uh, long meetings on a number of issues of, of uh, really keen and uh, uh, crucial mutual interest. I'd also say that um, as you think about greater uh, uh, attention in the Asian Pacific region, one of the most important things that we've done of late is actually engage other partners in talking about the Pacific and, and the Asia Pacific. If you think about everything that the United States has done of consequence globally for decades, it has been done hand in hand with Europe. So if you think of the Maghreb and you know uh, the Balkans, Iraq, Afghanistan, climate change, you name it, it's in close partnership. One of the only areas where we've had very little of that kind of engagement has been um, in the Asia Pacific region. So we have sought through a series of engagements with the EU and also a number of other uh, countries in Europe to have a deeper dialogue about Asia. And that would uh, stretch to issues like trade and economics uh, and people-to-people -people exchanges. So I would just begin by suggesting that as Asia rises, this is not how somehow the United States uh, absenting our responsibilities, our partnerships. In fact, we're working very closely or attempting to with a very enthusiastic group, enthusiastic group of Europeans who also want to focus more uh, on the Asian Pacific region. That would be the first point I would make. The second is, I, I think what is sometimes lost in the idea of greater focus on the Asia Pacific region is that um, at the center of much of this effort is a substantially increased diplomacy with China. Uh, very substantial and deeper economic, political, and people-to-people -people ties over the course of the last three or four years, and a determination on both sides to make clear that we are committed to uh, ensuring a different kind of relationship between uh, two great nations. Uh, and we are still stand by that determination uh, very clearly going forward. The third point is that um, if you look particularly over the course of the last year, I think you will see a different picture. Obviously, some of the uh, very modest military moves have received attention. But it is also the case that we have done a lot more on the business and people-to-people -people side. I see my colleagues here from the U.S. ASEAN Business Council and from the um, uh, other organizations that this summer helped sponsor one of the largest gatherings of American CEOs, business leaders, Asian leaders, to talk about enhancing business engagement in the Asian Pacific region. We're focused more on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We got the Korea Free Trade Agreement um, through. We're looking at much more educational exchanges. So we've heard actually very clearly that many in the region want to see a uh, United States that is engaged across the board on uh, issues that sustain uh, the prosperity uh, as well as peace in the Asian Pacific region. And that's what we're determined to do. So I, I think uh, what this calls for is a very careful uh, diplomacy, uh, a low-key diplomacy on the part of the United States and others to make clear our determination to work carefully productively um, with all the key nations in the Asian Pacific region, uh, particularly China. I'd like to take us back to the South Pacific. Uh, my name Greg. is Greg Casagrande of South Pacific Business Development. Hi, Greg. Hi. 
Um, Depending on oh. how the rest of this goes, uh, <laughs> I may be in touch with you for some of the career advice here. So, <laughs> Terrific. Uh, over two years ago, the United States committed to opening up a, a yeah. USAID office in Fiji. Yeah. Uh, that is yet to happen. Uh, with the office in P&G, uh, P&G is a very large nation. It's unlike any of the other uh, 12 other Pacific Island Forum nations. And so I'm wondering what USAID has planned for with regards to international development in the more traditional Polynesian, Melanesian, yeah. Micronesian, Pacific Island nations. And if uh, the Women's Empowerment Initiative that Secretary Clinton mentioned, whether that might dovetail with stuff like microfinance or yeah. microenterprise development initiatives, and stuff like that might be on the, uh, the agenda going forward. Thank you very much. And much of this has to do with resources, and I would really urge you to, Nisha Biswal at USAID is really the person who has been the architect of much what we want to do. But with, within our limited resources, we are quite ambitious with what we want to do. We want to match with international financial institutions. We want to look at a number of issues. One of the most important, frankly, is renewable energy resources. This is the highest potential you, uh, arena for uh, both wind energy and sun energy, the lowest use uh, globally, right? Um, uh, and we're trying to work with partners to be able to apply some of those technologies much more effectively. Microfinance is of critical importance in a number of these countries that have virtually no business um, uh, business uh, environment, but it's enormously difficult with transportation costs and just the unpredictability generally of commerce overall. Um, health and we're very high uh, rates of sedentary diseases. Those issues, working with New Zealand and Australia, will continue to be at the forefront. I have to say, some of the challenges are so profound and so deep. We we honestly look for areas that we can make marginal improvements in everyday life. For instance, when we were just at the PIF, we came up, one of the biggest problems in many of the Pacific Island nations is the disposal of trash. And we have worked with New Zealand and Australia to come up with an innovative technology to apply it to see if this can deal with some of the really endemic problems that we face on some of the Pacific Island nations. And frankly, that's one of the areas that we have been discussing with our Chinese interlocutors. And there is interest, and I do believe that we're going to be able to find some areas that we can work together uh, in the time ahead. No, I think it's coming. They, they Thank you. I'm uh, Dana Marshall with uh, American University. Kurt, good to see you again. Thank you, Dana. Thank good you. to see you as well. Um, question is, um, at a time of uh, political transitions in both China and the United States, and perhaps some very interesting developments uh, in China, uh, and also concerns regarding uh, economic developments in the sort of near to medium term in China, what's the U.S. government's thinking about kind of where do we end up in the beginning of the next administration here. What's the net result going to be? What's our best sense of that? And small mechanical question, are there any significant senior level dialogues that are being scheduled uh, between now, say, and mid-December with China? With China, uh, yes. I mean, there, we have a number of economic engagements. Um, I think the uh, JCTT is, I think, is that JCCT, sorry. So I've heard that the Chinese have not accepted that. I know that that's proposed for the fall. I don't know the exact timing, the, and I'll, I'll try to follow up on that as we go. I think you can expect that we will have sustained engagement in a number of venues at the United Nations, uh, uh, at the East Asia Summit in Cambodia. We are in very regular consultation with our uh, Chinese interlocutors. I will be hosted by Vice Prime Minister Sway for the Asia Pacific consultations. Uh, we think these are all important and they are critical um, opportunities for the kind of engagement that I was talking about earlier. Um, I, I think uh, the key for the next administration is um, when we look at the Asia Pacific region, you compare it with other regions. One of the things that is critically important, for instance, about Europe is the role of institutions and institutional dialogues. And that has sustained the kind of progress, secretariats and engagements and initiative for decades. 
what's interesting about Asia is that until quite recently, most of the um, institutions in Asia had very shallow roots. And I think the desire is to be able to invest more in key institutions like the East Asia Summit, hopefully APEC, like the ASEAN Regional Forum, like the Defense Minister's Dialogue, and deepen and broaden those and focus them on credible areas of cooperation that will sustain peace, prosperity uh, throughout the region as a whole. The other thing is also to sustain and build the bilateral and many lateral engagements in uh, Asia. So, uh, you know, a few years ago, only a few countries had sustained bilateral interactions between the United States. And I think somehow we thought that was in some way an advantage. It gave flexibility. I think we've taken a different course now in which virtually every country in Asia now we have a sustained um, uh, bilateral, sometimes minilateral set of interactions to talk about critical issues of mutual import, economic, political, and security. And that's helped build in a regularity into the system. It's hard because these are long distances, but it's very important. And I think um, it's uh, allowed us to s sustain a level of engagement that uh, uh, you know, supports transparency. At, at the heart of this, though, is really very elaborate and extensive interactions between the United States and China to build upon our existing dialogues and discussions with our allies like Japan and South Korea. And we're committed to those and we want to build those. And the hope is, Dana, that the next administration and thereafter will accept this, uh, these as sort of a down payment on future engagement. They may adjust some of these in, in certain ways, but I'm firmly of the belief that it is this kind of institutionalization that will lead to greater transparency, that will allow difficulties to be addressed uh, more effectively, and uh, I stand by that overall effort. Nadia? Hi, Kerr, welcome back. Nadia Chow with the Liberty Times. Hi, uh, we know that uh, Clint, uh, Secretary Clinton had a meeting with the uh, Lian Zhan, uh, mm -hmm. the representative for President Ma uh, in uh, APEC. Uh, most of the press release just indicate, you know, economic issue has been discussed. But as a stakeholder of uh, South China Sea and, uh, you know, East Sea, I, it's just, you know, hard to imagine none of these were mentioned during the conversation. I wonder, uh, could you tell us, you know, what's the exchange during this conversation? Mm -hmm. And what do you think about the President Ma's, uh, you know, East a C peace agreement, uh, not agreement uh, initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I, I'm not. I'm not going to go anything further about what I said, but I will say we uh, we had a, a, a useful uh, a set of interactions, primarily on economic issues, and the uh, the r uh, release uh, made that quite clear. We also talked about a range of other issues, but I think the focus was on how the United States and uh, Taiwan can take the necessary steps to enhance our economic uh, relationship uh, in the future. Uh, we strongly support the improvement uh, in relations across the Taiwan Strait, and we think that process should continue uh, and develop. But we also believe that a, 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 a strong, uh, unofficial relationship, which has a, a, a thriving economic uh, component, uh, is important between the United States and Taiwan as well. Um, Bing Ruan with Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Mm -hmm. um, one Pacific question, as you like. Um, there's, um, there's a criticism saying U.S. pivot to Asia is a slogan or it's just the rhetoric. To defend yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Great. What are those concrete achievements you've made in the past four years? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, and one more. Okay. When so you were in justify Asia. my life. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you were in Asia, um, you talked with your Japanese counterpart. Do you see any willingness from the Japanese side that they want to solve the disputes through dialogue? Thank you. Uh, well, on the first question. Uh, you know, I would I would have to say I think the record speaks for itself. I think I mean uh, 
we have a pretty good group here, pretty strong turnout, much more focused generally. I'll give you one example. The uh, Chicago Council on Foreign Relations just conducted one of its annual polls, and it suggested that the number of Americans that uh, viewed Asia as the next and most critical component of American foreign policy has ri risen dramatically in the last two or three years, not over a 10-year period, but just two or three years. I think there is a real recognition in the United States of the opportunities. And the focus really is on economic and people-to-people -people, uh, dimensions. I urge you all to, this is Marshall Bhutan's uh, good work. And that is backed up by a number of other uh, efforts that are undertaken uh, at the Committee on 100 and others that underscore uh, a recognition in the United States that this really is um, uh, critical to sustain our prosperity and our engagement uh, in the Asian Pacific region. And, you know, I, I think um, I, I would say simply that I have worked on a Asia for many, many years now, and uh, I have found uh, Asia to be very hospitable and very supportive of American engagement over the last uh, several years. And in fact, when we joined the East Asia Summit, the country that was first to welcome us and to support that effort was China. Uh, I think there is sometimes too much focus on, we, ha we have a very uh, uh, important complex relationship. There are areas of rivalry, but there are also deep arenas of cooperation and engagement. Uh, I think more of the latter uh, uh, should be focused on sometimes. And uh, I believe that there is a recognition that uh, we uh, are going to play uh, a sustained, uh, deep, and continuing role in the Asian Pacific region for decades to come. And that commitment is a bipartisan commitment. I'll take a few more fun questions here. So, <laughs> Kelly Curry from Project 2049. Hi, Kelly. Um, Next week, Aung San Suu Kyi will be visiting Washington. Yeah. And um, the relationship there has certainly been evolving between the United States and Burma over the past year quite dramatically in some ways. And I wanted to ask you about the U.S. government's hopes for this visit, um, what you expect to see happen, and yeah. who she might be meeting with. Yeah. I know that it's no, it's no secret that the United States government's played quite a critical role in her travel arrangements here also, yeah. and how comfortable are you with with the kind of relationship that that um, you have right now with her oh we're extremely excited about her visit uh, we're deeply involved in her visit but also the following week the president of uh, uh, the country is also visiting as well Tain Sein. Uh we're very supportive of, of his uh, engagements uh, we uh, support the efforts that he has taken uh, towards reform and obviously the role that Aung San Suu Kyi uh, uh, has played, will continue to play, is playing, will continue to play, will be celebrated in Washington, in New York, in many other cities around the United States. She has an incredible schedule, upwards of nearly 100 engagements over a couple of weeks. We're doing our best to help sustain and support that, and um, I, I just, I, we're thrilled by it. And I, I have to say, I just met with some uh, legislators from NAPIDA. They recognize all the challenges that, and it was from various parties, including the NLD and others, there are enormous challenges ahead, but I think the I think the the approach that the United States has taken is appropriate. Uh, I think it has uh, sent a message of of broad support, and we want to take the necessary calibrated steps to sustain uh, the reform process as it goes forward. We have a number of people in country currently discussing some critical issues associated with. Uh, violence inside the country. We want to play a productive role in dealing with those issues, not just ceasefires, but efforts towards reconciliation. There are a number of other uh, steps that we need to see in terms of economic reform uh, and uh, uh, other uh, challenges. But uh, I think it's, uh, if you compare to where we were a year ago, a year, year and two months ago, it's inconceivable how much progress that we've made um, uh, since then, and now the key is to sustain it. Hopes have been raised, and we can't let there be a big gap between 
hope and uh, the challenges that obviously exist on the ground. And we want to sustain that working with our partners, Europeans, others in Asia, uh, to sustain uh, what is taking root inside the country most clearly. So, Two more questions, more. okay? okay uh, Shah Adams from the Epoch Times. I'm just curious, uh, Secretary Clinton also visited Indonesia on the, mm -hmm. the trip. And I'm just wondering, uh, you talked about regional institutions. Yeah. Uh, with ASEAN, how's that, how's that going? Do you feel that there's positive movement there in developing a code of conduct? And, hmm. yeah. Well, thank you. Secretary Clinton uh, did indeed visit Indonesia. Um, while she was there, she paid a visit to ASEAN headquarters, the Secretariat, where we have an a, a ambassador. We're encouraging all the other participant nations to send an independent ambassador to support to build a secretariat and so that we don't just have one meeting a year that you have preparation that you have working groups that you can tackle problems of mutual interest our position is very clear uh, we support ASEAN centrality in terms of institutions in Asia we also support ASEAN unity we do believe as Secretary Clinton has said that the appropriate approach uh, is uh, a code of conduct uh, between um, uh, uh, between uh, China and ASEAN. Uh, we think Indonesia plays a critical role in this regard and uh, Indonesia has helped uh, to bridge gaps, to keep lines of communication open. Uh, they are undoubtedly in emerging as uh, the leader uh, in ASEAN and we support that uh, uh, very much. Last question. I thought I'd end on two fun questions. Tracy from the Singapore Straits Times. Um, so China hasn't been much of a campaign, uh, election campaign issue. Was there palpable relief in Beijing that it's not the punching bag issue that it's been in previous elections? And number two, um, Secretary Clinton's meeting with or non-meeting with Mr. Xi Jinping, was it a snub, not a snub? Do you know where he is? Thank you. <laughs> I think I'll take the first part of that question. So, uh, uh, the uh, you know, you know, it's, I, I'm going to say this. I was so disoriented by your second question, I forgot your first one. <laughs> what was it again? Sorry, just, re just, just. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, I look. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, I think. All Asians are attentive during election season on trade issues, on uh, human rights issues, and uh, China is no exception. Uh, and uh, there is always some focus and uh, concern. Uh, but I think, as we stated at the outset here, I think the fact is that there is a general recognition of the importance of the Asian Pacific region, the importance of the uh, uh, engagement with partners, including China. And so the election was not a particular focus of our uh, discussions during this particular trip. All right, you guys, if, you're gonna, if you let me escape, and then you can, you can continue the dialogue on the Pacific <laughs> Islands. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.